the show we've titled Lights Out, the final Brody Theater uh, show. And uh, we have a fantastic cast for you tonight of current and past ensemble members, people who've been with us over the last 22 years. Suggestion of uh, what's something that has a beginning? Universe. The universe. What a great suggestion. The universe. Oh, yeah. there's planets everywhere. <laughs> I like the ones with rings a little better. I, I only made one of those. Yeah. Oh, there's another one. Oh, that's a blue ring. Yeah, I call that one Uranus. <laughs> there's a desert planet, and there's microbes on this one. They're going to go somewhere. Maybe, maybe not. I know. Who's going to know? <laughs> not you! <laughs> on them for a little while. Do you think? Yeah. Yeah, we got a little deer. Oh. Oh. Well, it's our last night. <laughs> the reason is well, I've been doing this for 22 years. I, uh, I've, you know, there's never, nothing else in my life I've done for 22 years or more except be alive. And uh, so it's, it's, I feel it's time for me to move on. The, you know, I love the theater and I love the, the, the work we do, the creative work we do, but the, the job of running a small business that is a theater is, it, it's all consuming. It takes up all one's time and sometimes all of one's energy. So I have other things I want to do uh, creatively as well as just the, the notion, that dream of actually having some time off for a while. In the early days, if you wanted to do long form improv in Portland, there was only one place to do it. So it was hard to get on stage, but those people who were really dedicated, and that's where a lot of, not just students, but experienced performers got their first taste of long form, was being a guest performer at the Brody. And we didn't single-handedly build the improv scene as it is now in Portland, but we are one of the rocks that was at the center of it, for sure. At the time the Brody Theater opened, it was only the second improv theater in Portland and the first to showcase a format called long form. Today, there are several improv theaters in Portland and a thriving comedy scene, too. I had moved to Portland. I was 19. I had moved up with a, a guy that I didn't, I had only been dating a very short period of time, and that blew up spectacularly within a couple of months. And so all of a sudden, I was. I, had, I knew nobody, I had a new apartment, I had a new job, all at once, and no boyfriend. And I was freaking out. <laughs> the name of the store and then the, I guess he'll get those things. Probably the so. host. Okay. First person who yeah. enters the store. Does the ding ding. The, right, the establishes the, the ding. The yeah. And I remember calling him and talking his ear off because I was very excited. And I also was like, I have no money. <laughs> <laughs> so can I pay in installments? And he was like, yep, yep. I, so not only in the first class, I was also the first person to call. It was just one of those things where like, eh, let's, let's do it. Let's just jump into a class and see how we do. I was kind of a, a reclusive nerd that played lots of Dungeons and Dragons and that's how I got my yayos. So role playing was already kind of this feature in my life. Um, and it's weird too, because like people who meet me and who don't know I do improv, because I'm usually pretty, I'm a pretty reserved person. When I tell them what I do, they're like, you do what? You? On a stage? I can't see it until they see it. And then they're like, oh my God, how do you have that hiding in there? <laughs> um, and that, that's kind of how it was. It's like cluing into improv allowed me to open a door to myself where I could be more of an ambivert, extrovert kind of person rather than like, am I with, am I in my circle of safety? Do I know all these people? Okay, now I can kind of let loose a little. Once I kind of like touched that third rail in my life, it was a revelation. At the time I started the Brody, 
I didn't have the diagnosis, but I found out in adulthood I had ADHD. And the traits that I had that in the real world could be frustrating for me or for other people were really valuable. You know, that's telling you that something that has been seen as a failing is actually an asset. Tom Johnson worked in sketch comedy, stand-up, and improv for 15 years before starting the Brody Theater in Portland in 1996. He was taught in Chicago by comedy legend Del Close, the man largely responsible for bringing improvised theater into the modern age and coaching some of the top comedic talents of the late 20th century. Tom would go on to coach some of the top comedic talents to come out of Portland teaching both improv and stand-up classes at the Brody. Tom's had a long-standing friendship with Bob Odenkirk, and um, he came and played with us a couple times, and I think the, the last time he was here, um, he, he was on my side of the stage, the wings, and he said, let's go, and he pushed me out to play. You know, it was like, and it was a great, fun scene. That's like getting pulled up on stage at the Bruce Springsteen concert. You know? I think you have to understand that the Brody held a really important spot in the evolution of improv in Portland. It was always driven by the character of Tom Johnson. It wasn't interested in being popular. It was interested in ideals and in truth and the fact that if we concern ourselves with truth enough, we find the comedy. So Tom was really dedicated to that kind of Del Close approach to things is like, we only need to tell the truth. And as a matter of fact, like, our goals should be about what's funny and profound, not just what's funny. I just can't, I can't wrap my mind around it. How can it, how can space be curved? How can it be curved? Because if it's curved, what's out here? Say, this is the curve, what's beyond the curve? I don't know, sir. <laughs> Well, then I'll have the number three. <laughs> Some of the people who started out as my students ended up becoming teachers themselves. And a lot of those people worked for the Brody teaching, but they also uh, s spread out into the community. You know, there's several people who started at the, at the Brody as students, then became performers and teachers, and then ended up teaching at uh, Portland State University, Portland Community College and that that's a good feeling to me that something that they got involved with because they had an, an interest or a passion or were drawn to it, it ended up being something that they then were able to continue to pass along to other people i was just wondering um can you tell me a little bit more about your anthropology work you know, what that does all have to do with improv. I understand you wrote a couple books about it, and mm -hmm. and can you tell me, yeah, can you just tell me a little bit about that? Modern industrial life has forced everybody to compartmentalize and disconnect from the organic world and connect to the technological world. And so part of what makes me say that is in teaching improvisation, I got to watch and guide that process and listen to all the commentary of like, of like, I feel like I've woken up, I feel like I've found myself. And that was the, some of that had a lot to do with me as an anthropologist going like, there's way more here than anybody ever lets on to in a comedy class. And also, <laughs> just the fact that it can make almost every person feel that same thing means there's some universals here and there's some wisdom to be gleaned by looking really closely at this. There's no question that that I would have been a much more anxious, a lot more um, unable to negotiate social interactions. I mean, I'm just talking about the ways that it impacted me and my personality, but also, you know, being surrounded by, uh, particularly those beginning years, there were, there was kind of this group of young, they were older than me, five, ten years older than me, um, people who were smart and educated and uh, brilliant, and so they really kind of gave me a model of who I could be as I got older. 
we were talking tonight with some other people and how this has always been such a welcoming space um, that you you know, don't really find a lot of places, whether it be at your work or sometimes within your own, you know, social circles. So this is always a great place to come and be completely uninhibited and your true self. The Birdie Theater is uh, the place where it all started. This place is awesome and uh, I love everyone I've met here and I'm so thankful for everyone that I've met here and the things that I've learned and got to do. Um, and yeah, sorry to see it go, but I love this place and it will always live in my heart. Yeah. So, you know, Tom, I just wanted to thank you for all those years ago when that 30 year old from LA showed up in the basement of the bull ring, <laughs> probably wearing some silly leather jacket that really didn't seem like it was me. <laughs> but um, yeah, you know, you took faith in me all those years ago, and I mean, it's really because of that that my life is what it is. I mean, I found my wife Lisa here. <laughs> And again, from that, we have two beautiful children. Yeah. And countless friendships, you know? So, uh, you know, I'm, I'm always in your debt for that, Tom. And I'm, I'm just, I'm so grateful because uh, being a part of the Brody has just, uh, you know, changed my life in many ways for, through opportunities both on the stage and off the stage. So for that, I'm just super grateful. And I'm probably not crying right now because I'm probably in heavy denial <laughs> that this is happening. But uh, Tom, thank you so much. <laughs> month is that the Brody has meant a lot of things to a lot of people. So what we've done over the past weeks in these last shows and email blasts is we've tried to capture as many sentiments that people have about the Brody and put them in a book. So you That's have what them. was going on up there that you told me to get away from. That's for you, Tom. We love you. Oh. The hardest piece about, see this is where I get a little teary, the hardest piece about losing the Brody is, is losing that space for connection. Um, and, and improv does that, so I'm doing that elsewhere, but it was my sole focus for a very long time for 
It's the, the, the place for me to find people in my life who cared about me. I mean, it really is family. Don't, and erase that. <laughs> <laughs> off the record, that was off the record. As someone who hadn't been like in the Brody since 2012, life kind of proceeded on. A lot of the old timers, the original Brody cast, have actually come together to kind of hang out monthly again. So in ways, it kind of led to people coming back together. I just think it has such a legacy. Something like the Brody is you know, not so much a place as a community. It's really the people involved, the people who give their time and who have a passion. And being you know, not just the artistic core, but I think the emotional core of, of a place. something from last week. I'm here to do the final stand-up showcase, the final fly-ass jokes, and I've lined up a hand-picked crew of, of some of my favorite Portland stand-ups who were willing and able to do that show, and I'm going to perform in that show. I get here for that show, and I find out, because I check in with my email, that a really dear old friend I've known for 40 years died. And then I did the show and killed, killed it, <laughs> crushed it, crushed it. <laughs> so anyway, this happened, right? The next day, I wake up and the first thing I'm going to do is call the wife, the widow of my friend who had died. And before I did that, I went into the, the back room of my house to feed my cat, and I found him there dead. Oh, oh no. Yeah, exactly. Exactly the reaction you should have. <laughs> and so, Mel and I buried Boris, who's been with me for 16 years, raised him as a kitten with an eyedropper, and uh, unexpectedly, for no known reason. And then I went out and did some shopping for the theater. And I'm, I went into the cash and carry and bought what I needed to buy or supplies I thought we would need for that weekend of shows. And I came back out and there's a hearse parked next to my car with the engine running. Yeah, so I kind of looked up and went, I get it! I get it! And I've been thinking about this theater closing and the ending and then Dick Schneider died and then Boris died and then there's a hearse in the fucking parking lot with the engine running right next to my car. And all right. I got in my car, and I started up, and I looked over to the driver's seat of the hearse. This guy I know runs another improv club. <laughs> <laughs> I like. Sounds not, all right, okay, that's just Andy Barrett and his hearse. And everything's going to be all right. 